Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're so thankful for the new year. We're so thankful for any visitors that we have with us. You're welcome back at any and every opportunity that you have. Uh, My wife, Sarah, she is with one of our friends at Camden Avenue this morning, trying to uh, help her as as she, uh, she's trying to encourage today. Let's just put it that way. I'm thankful for uh, what she's doing, and she will be with us this evening, but that's where she's at. I know everybody... And where's the preacher's wife? <laughs> She's trying to do the best she can uh, by helping others, and, and certainly that's, uh, that's something to be uh, admired. And, and uh, we're so thankful for everybody that served this morning. We think about our Bible class teachers, so thankful for them. We're so thankful for our songs from Brother Dave, uh, our prayer, and certainly our reading. Always thankful for those things. You know, there's another year upon us. Another year has come and gone. It seems like they go so fast. It seems like they speed up. And certainly as as a year comes and goes, I think it's definitely time for uh, prayer and reflection. You know, there's a lot of things to reflect on at the turning of a year. Even in in the world, people take the opportunity to reflect. And I don't think it's a bad thing for a Christian to reflect. I think it's part of the Christian life to try to reflect on ourselves, see where our shortcomings are and where we can do better. And I wonder if you've done that so far. We're in day two. Have you had a chance to reflect? Reflect on on the goals that you have, perhaps uh, some of the ambitions you have. Certainly a lot of people, their mind turns to uh, their their profession perhaps, their business, and they set some goals for for their business or for their work, work, things that they'd like to accomplish. Maybe even people start thinking about things that they'd like to do with their family this year, Uh, planning out things to do, uh, activities to uh, pursue with the family. What are your resolutions for 2022? You know, certainly as a congregation, we, we would like to have those. And, and as I've, I've discussed things with the elders, certainly there are goals for this year for this congregation. Uh, I think next week we're going to look at going through the process of, of looking for elders. You know, good men that meet those qualifications. And certainly there's other things that we have on the agenda. We'd like to look at, at deacons and we'd like to look at other things that we can do to uh, be more engaged and serve uh, the Lord to the best of our ability. You know, I think of uh, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, Jesus, he, he says there, don't you know I should be about my father's business? And that's something that, that I have thought about a lot this week, being about the father's business. Are we about the Lord's work? Are we considering the Lord's work? Are we considering the things that we should perhaps add and do better? Are we considering things that perhaps we need to leave behind and move forward from? Mistakes of the past, failures of the past, uh, things that just need to be left behind, a fresh start to start anew. Certainly a new year is a time of reflection. You know, do you have spiritual goals for this new year? You know, a lot of the a common one is, is, is perhaps reading the Bible through in a year. And I've always uh, made it a goal to, to consider that, but it, it's uh, I almost when I start to break the goal down, uh, it, it's interesting. You know, if you were to do that, if you wanted to read the Bible through in a year, it's just 15 minutes a day. You know, you think about that, 15 minutes a day, we can find 15 minutes to do a whole lot of things. If you add all those 15 minutes up, you know what, uh, those 15 minutes for a week would add up to about an hour and a half. You know, an hour and a half is about, the, about a movie nowadays. Is, uh, if you get to do an hour and a half a week, you could get through the Bible in a year. You know, you think about that. That's sometimes the spiritual goal of somebody. Uh, I think of it in this respect. If it's only an hour and a half, maybe I could do three hours, and maybe I could get through the Bible twice in a year. But certainly there are other spiritual goals besides that. You know, when you think of growth and where you, where you are, where you've been, and you start to reflect all these things... Uh, Brother Roy was talking to me about a week ago, and he was talking about when, when he was growing up, and, and as many of us grow up, our parents would mark how much we have grown in that year. And perhaps there's a space in the house where, where mom and dad would just mark where you were at, where you were at, where you were at, and just see how much you've grown. How much have you grown spiritually? What are your spiritual goals? Perhaps it's to read the Bible, but perhaps there's some other things that you can target. What are your weak areas when it comes to your spiritual life? Do you struggle with forgiveness? Do you struggle with revenge? Do you struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle with peace? Do you struggle with humility? Do you struggle with pride? Have you ever tried to target one of those virtues? You know, Benjamin Franklin, certainly not a perfect man by any respect, but that was actually one thing that he had in his life is he tried to target a virtue or an attribute, and for so many days he tried to focus, and he would keep track and ask himself every day, how did I do with this? And he would target a weakness of his life. Certainly not a perfect man, but certainly an idea to admire trying to better ourselves spiritually. 
You know, when we try to go out into this new year as a congregation, as individuals, we want to be successful. And certainly there's some ideas given there to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. He says that if you really focus on the law, which we understand that he, he, we're talking about the old law there, but we understand that if we can focus on the Bible, not go off to the left hand, not go off to the right hand, and we go on God's journey, we follow Jesus Christ. He's our example that has left the steps there. If we try to follow his example, there are going to be some things that we need to pick up, and there's some things that we're going to have to leave behind. That's what I'd like to look at this morning and consider. As we press on into this new year, what are some things spiritually that we need to pick up? What are some spiritual things that we need to leave behind as we press forward into this new year? Because as he tells Joshua, don't go off to the left hand, don't go off to the right hand. He tells them these, and he says that your way may be prosperous. In some other versions it says successful. Certainly if we're on a spiritual journey, we want to be successful. So looking to the words of God would be our best way to go. You know, as I think of a journey, first thing I think of is growing or picking things up. What are some things that you need to pick up this year on your spiritual journey? You know, I think about picking things up or growing as a Christian. Certainly, that's part of a Christian's life. Physically, a lot of times we can see that growth, particularly in young ones. We can see that growth. We can see that progression in a physical sense. Are you progressing spiritually or are you at the same spot that you were a few years ago? Are you trying to pursue godliness Certainly reading the Bible is one aspect of it, but a part of Christianity is applying those things. Are you applying the Bible better than you did last year? Have you learned things that you did not know previously? What are you picking up this year? You know, it's part of your Christian journey. It's part of my Christian journey to grow. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory now and forever. Amen. What traits are you going to try to pick up this year? Because if you're going to try to pick up some traits that God wants you to have, some attributes, some virtues, some morals that God wants you to have to be better at, you're going to have to target those. You're going to have to know what God has to say about that particular issue. What does God say about humility and pride? How does he lead us towards humility, leads us away from pride? How can God lead us closer to peace and farther away from anxiety? We all struggle with these different things. But God is trying to lead us there. And as he tries to lead us to these places, as he tries to take us from anxiety to peace, he says, here's some tools. As he tries to take us from being less prideful to humility, he says, here's some tools. As he tries to take us throughout our lives from perhaps being bitter to joy, he tries to give us some tools. And where can those tools be found? In the inspired word of God. What traits are you going to pick up this year? Are you going to try to be more at peace this year? You know, we all are not perfect. We are all human. But can we be perhaps more at peace this year than we were last year? Can we perhaps be more joyful than we were last year? Can we be more loving than we were last year? Are you looking for the blueprint? Are you looking for the pattern which God gives? In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that they may grow thereby. There's an expectation of growth in the Bible, just like there's an expectation when it comes to physical growth. Are you at the same spot that you were last year? And that's a question you really have to look at yourself and answer. Am I at the same place I was last year? Have I gained an attribute? Have I, have I become better in this uh, spiritual area? Have I gained in knowledge uh, of the scriptures? Am I better than I was in the past? A time of reflection. You know, we think of physical growth year by year. We can see those, that, that growth. How different are you this year than last? Are you better than you were? Is your progress evident? You know, I think of uh, Paul as he's writing to the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 15. He says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Timothy, look to the scriptures. Timothy, study the scriptures as, as, a, as a young preacher. Study, look at those things that have been taught, that you know have been taught. And your progress will be evident to all. Is your progress evident to all? Can can people see the growth? Can they see your spiritual growth? That's what God wants for you. And when I think about my growth, I don't necessarily always think about people's outward perception. I think about how God perceives me. How does God think I have grown in this past year? 
If God would look at me and say, Kyle, here's where I know you were at, because God knows all things, and God and, and Kyle, I know you're here. Does he see progress? Does he see my efforts? Does he see me trying to give my best to try to, to look and reflect and see my weaknesses so that I can, can look at those weaknesses and I can try to be a little bit better? We all have different weaknesses. We all have different struggles. But can we be one step better? Can we be one inch better? That's what God is looking for. He is looking for our growth. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 15, he tells the young preacher Timothy, he says, dedicate yourself to these things that your progress may be evident to all. Growth is an expectation in the Bible. If it's not an expectation, why in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 it is really, we have this idea of these people, uh, almost this idea of getting after these individuals because of their lack of growth. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. When I think about growth, particularly spiritual growth, who's doing the evaluation? You know, when we go to uh, get our evaluation, we go to the doctor, and the doctor might have a checklist. He has some forms, and, and I know when my kids go, he's got the bell curve, and he tells me how my kids are percentile-wise and height and these different attributes. Who's doing your spiritual examination? You know what? You should be on that list. And you know who else is on that list that's a little bit intimidating? God is on that list. So you might be able to put up a smoke screen and say, oh, I'm growing, and I'm growing at the rate that I should. Really, God knows. I'm not saying we're all going to grow at the same rate. I'm not saying we're growing in all the same attributes in the same, in the same ways. We all have different struggles and different issues. Are we growing? And when God looks at us, does he see the growth? How do you measure up? You know, really, growth is a transformation, is it not? We think of a seed to a sprout, to a tree, and then a tree that actually produces fruit. Growth is a process. Growth is a transformation. How's your transformation going? It, it can, you, you started as a seed, and then, you, then you're a sprout, and, and then you're a tree, and then now you're producing fruit. Where are you in the growing process? Where are you spiritually? I want you to look at that and kind of picture yourself. Am I still at the seed phase? Am I at the sprout phase? Am I at the tree phase? Am I at the fruit phase? Because God wants you to grow. He wants you to produce fruit. It's truly a transformation, what God is looking for. And transformation is not easy. Growth is not easy. But it's certainly what we should be looking to in this new year. What can I add to my Christian toolbox? What, how can I improve as a Christian? And in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Has your mind changed over the course of a year? Have you drawn closer to God? Have you drawn closer to His teachings? Have you taken His teachings and tried to make them a part of you? We think of Galatians where it says we're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Is that Christ inside of you becoming a little bit stronger? Becoming a little bit more of a percentage of yourself? Are we growing the way that we should? You know, a change of year, a time of reflection is a chance to revive our attitude to the kingdom of God, to revive our attitude to serve God to the best of our ability, to be the example God would want us to be. We think of Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, where it starts talking about that good example. It starts to talk about being the salt of the earth. Can you be a little saltier this year? Can you be a little brighter this year? It talks about that light that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Can you be a better example this year than you've been in the past? What area do you need the most work? You know, it's one thing to look at our strengths because typically our strengths are things that we've always almost had a little bit of, it's always something that maybe we were always okay at. And we like it improving in that area because we've always been okay in that area, you know? Well, Kyle's always been okay with, with this area, so it's easy for him to improve in this area. But there's another area you need to look at. You need to look at your weaknesses. What are you weakest at in the Christian life? Are you weakest in the area of anxiety? Are you weakest in the area of pride? Are you weakest in the area of, and, and the list can go on and on, is your weakest area hate? Is your weakest area revenge? Is your, what's your weakest area as a Christian? I have my weakest area. 
In fact, I try to. I have I have four spiritual goals, and I'm not going to necessarily share them. But I, I do write. I write them down, just like I do any of the physical goals I have in my life. I write down my physical goals, and I also have spiritual goals. And you know what? There's a couple weaknesses on that list. Some things I said, Kyle, you kind of struggle with this. The Bible says you should be doing this, and you're doing this. You need to work on this. None of us are perfect, and we have to diagnose those places where we need help, where we need assistance, and try to move forward. Can you be a little bit more joyous this year? The opposite of joy, perhaps, would be bitterness, but Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, as you study the scriptures, don't we have so many uh, avenues that we could pursue that, that would bring more joyful thoughts into our life? I don't think there's a time in a Christian's life where we can't bow down on our knees and say, Thank God. You know, what time in your life, if you're a Christian, no matter what's going on in your life physically, that you can't go on your knees and say, thank you, God. You know, I think of James chapter 1 and verse 17, where it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. It doesn't matter what's happening in my life. I can always be thankful to God. And perhaps that thankfulness can lead to joy. Can I focus on those things that the Bible wants me to focus on more consistently? Can I focus on those spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3? I think the first question I ask myself when I try to reflect on, on my own spiritual life is what can I pick up this year? What can I pick up? Something that I've struggled with in the past that I haven't had, what's something I can pick up and be better than I have been in the past? But you know what? If you're on a spiritual journey with God, which is that's what we're on, there's certainly thing that God wants us to pick up. He wants you to put these things in your backpack and, and take them with you on your journey. He wants you to take joy. He wants you to take peace. He wants you to take love. These are things He wants you to take. He knows these things are what's best for you. He wants you to load those up in your backpack so you'll be better prepared for the journey so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. Not a health and wealth gospel, but the idea of the Christian life is really the best life to live. A life with love on the mind, a life with joy on the mind, a life of peace. What are you going to pick up this year for your spiritual journey? Then we go to our second point. What are you going to leave behind? You know, I would encourage you to look and evaluate your life and reflect. There are some things I would encourage you to leave behind. You are carrying some things on your spiritual journey that God did not ask you to carry. You know, it's like me going on a hike, me putting a big refrigerator on my back, and everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. Why are you taking that refrigerator? I don't know. I just thought, it, I just thought I, I'd take a refrigerator. Well, you can't plug it in anywhere. Why are you taking that? It's weighing you down. Well, I just thought I would take it. Why are you carrying a refrigerator on a hike? Don't carry that. You know, there's some things that you need to evaluate in your life. You might be carrying some things right now that God does not want you to carry. He does not want you to carry a refrigerator on your spiritual journey. Many people, and I think it can happen to, it can happen to me, it can happen to all of us, is there are certain things that we pick up throughout life that we try to take on our spiritual journey that we should not be taking. God said, let it go. Let it be. Leave it behind. Press forward. Do not carry that with you. And you know what we try to do? We try to say, God, I'm taking this refrigerator. Why are you taking the refrigerator? Don't take that. But many times people do. Certainly no one's perfect. Certainly God cares for us. But there's some things that God does want you to leave behind that are weighing you down. Perhaps it's the anxieties of life. It's weighing you down in your service to the Lord. I'm not saying that we're perfect individuals, and I'm not saying that anxiety isn't there, but God is really trying to lead you from anxiety to peace. Now, we all fall on that spectrum some way, but God's trying to lead you to peace. I don't think you can read the Bible and think that He's trying to lead you any other way. Read Matthew chapter 6. You know what? God does not want you to carry bitterness into the next year. You know, bitterness is, is really not a good thing to carry. It's going to eat you up on the inside, and yet so many people try to carry it. You know, some people try to carry hatred, don't they? They try to carry hatred. What a heavy load to carry on your spiritual journey. Some people try to carry thoughts of revenge. Some people try to carry past failures on their spiritual journey. Have you ever thought that your spiritual journey might be hindered because of the things that you are not leaving behind. You know, I, I do think of Matthew chapter 6. I mean, the lesson's not really designed for this, but although it, it's just popping into my mind, when I think of anxiety, you know, you think about anxiety, I think there's, I guess there's two ways you can look at it. You can be concerned or you can be worried. 
Concerned is, I see a problem, and I'm going to do everything in my power to address that problem. But once I've done everything to address that problem, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray to God. And I'm going to try to push on. Now, worry, it doesn't go quite the same way. Worry is, I'm going to keep thinking about this problem, but I'm not going to try to think about solutions. And I might even do everything that I can do, but I'm still going to carry all this emotional weight. God doesn't want you to carry that weight. And in Matthew chapter 6, where he's talking about worry, he says, hey, I take care of the birds, I take care of the flowers. Won't I take care of you? Won't God take care of us? Yes, he will. But also, in that same passage, in Matthew chapter 6, I, I believe verse 27... I better check my notes on that one. I think it's Matthew chapter 27. He says, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? Let's put that into our own terminology. Which of you, by worrying, can add a foot to your height? We know that we can't. But yet we'll waste all our time and emotional energy on something that we can't control. Which of you, by worrying, can add one day to your life? Now, I'm not saying concern. Concern is I look at the problem, I do everything that I can to prevent that problem, and then I leave the rest up to God. That's concern. But worry is I'm just going to keep thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. Let it go. You're carrying things on your spiritual journey that you should not carry, and they will weigh you down. A lot of times I see Christians, perhaps myself even at times in my life, I have carried past mistakes and failures on my spiritual journey. I'll tell you, that will weigh you down quicker than anything. But you know what God told you about your baggage of mistakes and failures? The times that you came up short, the times that you think that you let people down, that you let God down. He told Christians in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. The Son of God cleanses from all sin. In 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes, and we can learn from those, but a lot of people will, they, 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 uh, I wouldn't say they're learning from them, they're carrying them with them. And they, they get beat down over and over again by this mistake that happened five years ago, ten years ago, a day ago, and they just carry it with them on their spiritual journey, and they don't acknowledge it's slowing you down. It's hurting your spiritual growth because you're hanging on to these things that God said let go. What did God say when we fall short, we go to God in prayer, we, we confess our sins, and we say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I need to move on. I don't want to do this again. You know what he says? He cleanses us of that. He says, you know what, Kyle? I know you made this mistake. I know you're sorry for it. You've learned from it. You're trying to move on. Let me take that out of your backpack so you can press on, so you can grow the way that you should. Some of us are carrying things that we should not be carrying. What things are you carrying in your spiritual backpack that you should not be carrying that God said, let it go? You know, you think about that idea. We ask God to forgive us. You know, we become Christians. We're baptized. Our sins are washed away. And then in 1 John there, we see a Christian that, that falls short, you know, confessing their sins and God forgiving them. You know, God tells us on multiple occasions, what does he do with our sins? It, it, he says on some occasions he casts them into the deepest sea. And in Hebrews, he says he remembers them no more. So the question is, why are you remembering your mistakes? Why are you carrying them in your backpack? Because God wants them out of your backpack. Leave those behind. They're slowing you down. And I have, saw, I have observed, perhaps in myself at times, and in fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, is they will let things of the past that should be forgotten, that should not be in their spiritual backpack, that should not be on the hike, they'll carry it for a large portion of their life. And God says, I've forgiven you. I remember it no more. I've cast it in the deepest depths of the sea. If God is forgetting some of our load, then why do we persist on carrying it? You know someone who had a lot of baggage? Think of the Apostle Paul, also known as Saul. Certainly he had a lot of baggage. Could the Apostle Paul have carried the baggage of Ripping families out of their homes, splitting up families, really persecuting Christians on, on, the, on really the, the highest level. How could he carry that? And I think part of it is he had to let go and say, I can't take this on my spiritual journey. And we do see it pop up on occasion. I think he's human, and he had to deal with this just like any other individual. But some of the lesson is, going into this new year, you've got to let some things go. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize, for the upward call of Jesus Christ. Forgetting those things which are behind. 
reaching forward to those things which are ahead. What are you hanging on to? What are you carrying that God said let go of a long time ago? Like I said, I, I don't think Paul was, was perfect. I don't think Saul was perfect. But certainly, when we reflect on his life, I think he could not live the Christian life the way that he did without letting a lot of the things go that God said let go. We think of so many people, actually, when we start to reflect on it. We think of David, a man after God's own heart, who has an affair and has other mistakes throughout his life. Could he have served God without letting some of those things go of the past? We think of Peter, and Peter denying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on multiple occasions. He had to let that go. I see it so many times that it perhaps almost... Uh, on occasion has, has uh, made me cry. Brothers and sisters in Christ carrying things that they should not carry. Carrying loads that God said he would take care of long, long ago. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. He says, I'm going to forget it. Will you please forget it so that you can move on and live your best spiritual life? Some people will beat themselves over their head with their failures over and over again. And actually, I think Satan has a big hand in that. Because he doesn't want you to run the race. He wants you to walk the race. And then he doesn't want you to walk the race. He wants you to fall down on the side of the racetrack and just give up. And he does that because we won't let go of the weights which God said, I have forgotten. I want to relieve you of those don't lose sight of that which is ahead. Certainly that is the goal. We look at Philippians chapter 3 there. That, goal, that forgetting those things which are behind but reaching forward to those things that are ahead. You know, when we became Christians, that was the picture that was given to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We still have a battle on our hands. We still have a fight on our hands. But that idea of a new start, a fresh start, and yet how many things do we carry on that we should not be carrying? It's like going on a hike and carrying that refrigerator. Why in the world are you carrying that refrigerator? But yet when it comes to a spiritual sense, there's a whole bunch of people carrying their, their, their refrigerator. They're carrying the things that they should not be carrying. They should have let go long, long ago. Let go of those mistakes let go of, of those regrets. Certainly when things happen and we repent, we want to make things right as best we can. But once we've done everything we can to make that situation right, we've got to move on and press on and do those things which God wants us to do. As we go to our last point, if you think of your life as a spiritual journey, there's some things that you need to pick up this year. What are you going to pick up this year? Perhaps reading the Bible through in a year, fantastic. But what are perhaps some, some virtues or some morals that you can pick up this year and say, you know what? These are some things I need to add to my, to my backpack. I need to try to add a little bit more peace to my life. I want to try to add a little bit more joy to my life. I want to try to add a little bit more love into my life. But what are some things that you need to leave behind? Perhaps there's some anxieties you need to leave behind. Perhaps there's some bitterness that you need to leave behind. Perhaps there's some revenge or hatred that you need to leave behind. Leave some things behind so you can run the race that's set before you. The last point is, is as we go on this journey, we're picking things up and we're leaving things behind. We need to remember to be resolved. You know, individually, we have to make these decisions. You know, it's easy to preach a lesson. It's easy to, to say things. It's a lot harder to put these things into action. As we see, so many goals, unfortunately, will go by the wayside as the year goes on. Do you have a way of reminding yourself of your goals? I've heard all kinds of things that people have done, you know. People post them on their mirror, you know, getting up and, you know, just all these different things. But I think there might be something to that is you need to keep those things that are most important to you at the front of your mind and the front of your life. And one of those has got to be God. And I think a really good way for us to do that is to assemble with those that are pursuing God just like us. We're encouraged when we come together and we see other people trying to fight the same kind of battles we are. It might not be exactly in the same in name, but in relation to we're all trying to beat our best. We're all, all trying to be better each and every day. Are you resolved? 
What do you want to be accomplished this year? You know, that decision is on your shoulders. I, I think of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Brethren, I, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This next year, are you determined to be strong in the Lord? You're going to need some strength. You're going to need some focus. I think of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. It kind of gives that uh, picture of a battle, a battle scene. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Be strong in strength. Be strong and stand against the wiles of the devil. Are you doing those things in preparation that you need to do? That idea of putting armor on, that idea of I'm resolved for this to get accomplished spiritually. What are some things that you could do that perhaps you could set things up in your life so that you might be more likely to fall through with those goals? Perhaps some, tell somebody about your goals. I always tell my wife, sometimes i got some crazy goals. <laughs> so I, I don't branch out too far, but sometimes it's a good thing to tell other people what you're trying to do. Well, Kyle, you told me you are going to try to read the Bible through in a year. You know, I'll, I'll try to do it with you. Where are you at? You know, where are you at? Are you in Deuteronomy? Are you in Leviticus? Where are you at? Are you putting on the armor of God? Are you trying to do preparation? Are you taking the words of God, trying to apply them to yourself? You know, this year you have a chance and an opportunity, and each of us as an individual have this chance and opportunity to be a light to the world. To be a light to our family, to be a light to our community, to be a light to our state, to be a light to our nation, to be the best Christian that we can be. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. We need to be strong if we're going to accomplish what the Lord wants us to accomplish. We need to be brave if we're going to accomplish what the world, what, what the Lord wants us to accomplish. You know, when I go through the Bible, well, maybe it comes from what my dad would tell me growing up, is you can always take something good or bad from everybody that you meet. You know, what not to do, what to do. And I really view the Bible in that, that respect. Is, is every time I read about somebody in the Bible, I'm like, what good can I take away from this person? Well, what's the thing I'm trying to learn not to do from this person? And, and when I look at the book of Acts and I look at the Christians that are there, I admire their tenacity, I admire their courage, I admire their commitment. They were not part-time Christians. That's certainly not the case. Their lives were threatened. All kinds of matter of things are happening. In fact, many times they're, they're beat. Many times they, they are charged not to speak anymore about Jesus. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, it says, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Are you strong? Are you brave? Are you committed to the Lord? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your faith will be tested. Your loyalty will be tested. And as a Christian, we want to be better each and every day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read about these individuals that are giving beyond their means. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, these individuals are giving beyond their means. And I'll start in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says, For I bear witness, according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us much urgently, with much urgency, that we should receive the gift the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Have you given yourself to the Lord? Have you given yourself to the Lord's journey? In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. God, where are you going to take me? He's going to take you to go pick some things up. And he's also going to take you to lay some things aside. And he's going to encourage you to press on every step of the way. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Where am I going, Lord? To places you've never been before. You're going to pick up some things 
that you didn't plan on picking up. <laughs> You're going to drop off some things that you didn't plan on dropping off. And certainly he knows what's best. As you reflect on yourself, as we go into this year as individuals, but also as we go into this year collectively as a congregation, what do you need to pick up for your journey? What do you need to lay down for your journey? And certainly, as we think about our lives, certainly let us press on and do that which the Lord wants us to do. Let's be about our, our God's business, just as Jesus said, let me be about my Father's business. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. There would be no better way to start the new year than to start it in Christ, to be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, be added to the church. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian, or perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way that we can if you come as we stand and as we sing.